Hey gang, I'm Jim Zub. I'm a professional comic book writer who's done work for just about every major comic publisher in North America. I put together these videos to supplement the free tutorials that I have on my website talking about the comic book business, how I broke in, and techniques on comic book writing and collaborating with artists. As much as possible, I try to demystify the process and let people know about how comics work and how the publishing industry works when it comes to the comic book medium. A lot of the questions that I answer here come from either my Patreon or from the Comic School Discord. This particular question came from YouTube, a comment on one of my earlier videos. A gentleman named Rival Steven says, how do you handle the stress of juggling four comics in a day job? I feel like my current nine to five just leaves me too exhausted and frustrated to work on just one comic, let alone four. So Steve, I think that's a really good question, but it is kind of difficult for me to answer cohesively and give you specific advice because I don't know your particular situation. I don't know your working situation. I don't know your career situation. All I can do is sort of talk about the things that I do and hopefully that'll show some kind of broader patterns in terms of this stuff. First off, uh, if you don't follow me on social media or you're not keeping track of my career, you may not know that I actually have a day job. So I teach at Seneca College. I've been part of their animation faculty since 2003, started off part-time there and now am full-time. That full-time day job, that teaching gig has allowed me to kind of ride out the highs and lows of a freelance creative career. It has allowed me to take risks on projects. It has allowed me to you know, finance my own creator owned projects and know that at the end of the day, you know, my mortgage is gonna get paid. The groceries are gonna get bought. You know, that, that, um, that stability is really, really potent in terms of my ability to get this stuff done. On top of all of that, you know, in my particular situation, it, it feels a little weird to talk about the personal, but in this case, it's, it's really relevant. You know, um, my wife and I, uh, we don't have any kids and we don't have any pets. Now, that wasn't a specific thing that we decided in terms of career. It's just the way it all kind of worked out. Stacy and I started dating kind of later in life. We were both in our 30s. We both had very well-established kind of lives. And by the time we came together and made decisions about our future, we realized we didn't want to have kids. It wasn't in the cards for us. And then on top of that, I'm incredibly allergic to cats. You may not know that when you see how many cats are in a series like Wayward, but hilariously, both Stephen Cummings and I, the co-creators of Wayward, we're both crazy allergic to cats. We think they're great and they're wonderful in that story, but we actually can't deal with them. Like even just a, a few minutes with most cats, particularly long haired ones, and my eyes will puff right up and I am out of commission for the rest of the night. Stacy loved cats but it wasn't gonna work out with us to you know, have them and be in a relationship together. So the decision was made that we weren't gonna have you know, cats, we weren't gonna have pets. It's just kind of the way that that worked out. So right off the bat, again, I don't know your specific living circumstance, I don't know your work circumstance, but those are two really big you know, responsibilities and, and I don't wanna say time sinks in terms of bad things. They're just things that take up time, literally time sinks, you know, um, that I don't have to deal with in general. And if I'm on a crunch period, you know, creatively, I don't have to compromise in the sense of like, oh, you know, a child needs a certain amount of attention, totally understandably. And there's very little room for negotiation in that stuff, particularly if it's a baby or, you know, very young. I can work that kind of stuff out with Stacy. My wife and I are able to negotiate and, and you know, make sure that our schedule functions in order to complete projects and still spend time with each other in a pretty you know, uh, cohesive way. So that right from the get-go, I feel like I have a leg up in terms of being able to do this stuff. I've got this creative and flexible day job that has been extremely good to me. I've got you know, the flexibility in terms of my schedule. But even still, that being said, that does not mean that right from the get-go, I was juggling three, four projects at a time, which is generally what I'm doing now. You have to keep in mind that a creative career is a matter of progression. And there are highs and lows to these things, but there are also evolutions of it. So if you're looking at getting started in terms of comics or any kind of creative career, and you're like, man, I wish I could, you know, juggle all these projects. I wish I could put together all this stuff. 
you have to keep in mind that this process takes a long time. It takes a long time to figure out you know, what you want to do, how you do it best, build up those working relationships, build up those industry contacts, put out those first few creative works, and then get that momentum. And even still, there are no guarantees. So as much as possible, you need to kind of build up your own momentum and understand that this is a longer kind of marathon. This is not a sprint. These creative careers just don't work that way. I'm gonna go through kind of my creative career and show you the length of time between some of these major projects. And a lot of the things that you may not know about how long it took me to get traction in this stuff. I'm not doing this to brag. I'm really doing this just to give you a broader sense of, if anything, I, I don't think it's really bragging because there is there are long gaps and there is a, an extensive period of time as I work my way through this stuff. So although I was trained in classical animation and my first few, I guess you could say industry gigs were animation related, in terms of a comic book career, I started with a web comic. In late 2001, I put, you know, hand coded my own website and I started posting images of a uh, story that I put together called The Makeshift Miracle. I don't talk about it as much now because I'm known primarily for writing. I'm not known as an illustrator, you know, or an animator, but my background really is in art. So this webcomic ran from 2001 to 2003. I did, you know, over 170 pages for this kind of, I guess it's a digital graphic novel that I was posting online. Um, it was my first way of telling a comic book story in any kind of cohesive way, more than the, the kind of stick figure stuff or really simple drawings I did as a kid. And it was also a way for me to understand the medium and start producing something on a regular basis. Although there were some gaps, for the most part, I was producing Makeshift Miracle three days a week. So every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, a new page would go up. And slowly but surely, I built up a small readership. You know, web comics at the time were just kind of getting their feet. There were a handful of people that were doing them. It was an exciting time to be online and to create things. Uh, Makeshift Miracle really was my kind of training ground, a way for me to figure out the comic book medium, to make mistakes, but to also force myself to put up things on a regular basis. And then in 2012, I would end up working with the Udon Studio. We got a brand new artist named uh, Shun Hong Chan, and he came back and did this incredible watercolor version of the story. I did some rewriting and expanding of the kind of mythology of the series. And that would end up uh, being just a, an incredible experience to go back and retell that story in a new and amazing way. In 2007, Udon published the original Makeshift Miracle as a book, and that's still my first published book. You can see there it's got my full name, Jim Zubkovich, on there instead of, you know, Jim Zub, which is the pen name that I use now. And then in 2012 and in 2013, we released the new version of Makeshift Miracle as two books. Book one is called The Girl From Nowhere and book two is The Boy Who Stole Everything. I'm really incredibly proud of the webcomic. I'm really proud of the kind of story that I was telling there. It's a coming of age story and a bit like Stand By Me meets Sandman or something like that. I, as lofty as that sounds, maybe, you know, it's not gonna hit those highs, but that's the kind of emotional core I was going for this uh, really kind of touching, surreal, emotional story. And even still, you know, it was an amazing experience to put that together in 2012 and 2013, but that is not, you know, instantly going to, to vault me over into doing other comics. My first job at Udon, we're talking in 2003, was actually Conan the Barbarian, but not the way you might expect. I actually recolored uh, pages of the original Conan stories, the Roy Thomas and Barry Windsor Smith stories that were republished by Dark Horse when they had the rights to Conan. So I worked on Chronicles of Conan, volume one and volume two. And it was really exciting to be able to, you know, uh, work on those stories and do the digital coloring on them and, um, you know, be part of, of this comic that meant so much to me when I was a kid. This is my first published credit. This is before the Makeshift Miracle book was made and published. This is, you know, uh, the first stuff that I was putting out. 
at the time when I was working at the Udon studio, they were putting out all kinds of different comics. They were probably known best for the Street Fighter series they were doing. But in my division, uh, you know, where we were working was called Creative Services. And so we were putting together artwork for RPGs. So I was doing artwork for uh, White Wolf, primarily on the Exalted series, and artwork for Dungeon Magazine over with Paizo. We did artwork for tons of different tabletop RPGs. And as someone who grew up on those games, it was an absolute joy to be able to contribute to these things and to be a very tiny part of that industry. And the friendships and the contacts that I made, you know, in those early years doing RPG art and going to those conventions was, was just a thrill to me. It was just uh, so much fun. The Udon Studio was pretty synonymous with the Exalted role-playing game, and we put together a proposal and released an Exalted comic series. So I co-wrote this series and worked with an amazing set of artists and, and co-writer, and we put together this really cool mini-series, and it's my first published writing credit. Um, the release schedule was not monthly as much as we hoped it would be, and the impact was sort of mixed, like we uh, did pretty well out of the gate and the Exalted fans really liked it, but you know, uh, our tabletop RPGs are already kind of a small audience, and then this is, you know, a sub audience of a sub audience, so it was difficult for us to kind of get traction out of the gate, but I am really, really proud of the series and really glad we were able to put it together, and it was a really cool experience for me to learn about putting out a regular comic. But when you get right down to it, my entire publishing output in 2005 is four single issues. And in 2006, it's a single issue. And then the wrap up of the story that we did in the trade paperback. So even though I had done Makeshift Miracle as a web comic, my writing career really is just barely getting started over the course of these two years. A year later, we published Makeshift Miracle, but that is still the webcomic that I did four years earlier. So I don't have any new content. The only new content that I did was literally a one-page story that I did in the Comics Festival anthology. So for an entire year, I have one page of new comic material that I've generated. A year later is when I put together the first uh, short story with Chris Stevens called Two Copper Pieces which is the premiere of what will eventually be Skull Kickers, that comes out in 2008. So again, you're talking about 10 pages of content for an entire year. That was my output in 2008. 2009, uh, I've got another one-page story in the Comic Festival anthology. I have another short story in Pop Gun. That short story is literally four pages. And then I have a six page backup story in an issue of Street Fighter II Turbo. So for the entire year, we're talking about 11 pages worth of content in 2009. In 2010, I've got two commercial projects that I'm putting together. So I did the writing on a story that Udon did to help promote the Clash of the Titans movie that came out that year. And I write a four issue mini series of uh, Ibuki from Street Fighter. And that is me solo as the writer. And then that fall, I released Skull Kickers. So this is kind of, to most people, where they see me and my kind of breakout. This is where I'm working on my own book and image. And it's supposed to be a mini series, but we're able to turn it into an ongoing. And those first four issues come out. So, you know, September through to December, we put out those four issues. And I wouldn't say they make a huge splash, but at the time, uh, creator-owned books were heating up. And so we had multiple printings of the first issue. We had multiple printings of the second issue. And people were buzzing on creator-owned concepts. And for the first time, I felt like I was starting to make some traction in terms of proving to people I could write. But then I want you to look the very next year my entire writing output is only Skull Kickers. It's not like releasing that series suddenly had publishers beating down my door and offering me projects. In uh, 2011, you know, I do put out eight issues of Skull Kickers, which is great. In 12 months, we're able to release those eight issues. And I think they're really high quality and they show really well. And I'm feeling confident and excited about the progress that we're making. But again, you know, it is a slow, slow climb. And because Skull Kickers is creator owned, I'm helping to finance this. Uh, you know, it is, if anything, it's, it's kind of a really expensive hobby for me at this point. 
I'm establishing myself as a writer, but I'm not getting, you know, commercial accolades. I'm not getting Marvel or DC or IDW or Dynamite or Boom or any of these companies beating down my door. I'm still establishing myself in terms of that writing credibility. And if you look at what I'm putting out in that year, I've got 20, I guess you could call it releases. 14 of those are creator owned and six of them are work for hire. And so the majority of my output is self-generated, you know, creator-owned content. If I wasn't creating it, I wouldn't have any momentum over those three years, 2009, 2010, 2011. So over three years, you know, those 20 different releases, those issues come out and I'm slowly, slowly building momentum. It's not until we get to 2012 that now we're getting actual commercial writing work mixing in with my own, you know, independent releases. So Skull Kickers is still going in that year. You know, we put out six issues in 12 months and I get my first work for hire writing gig, which is at Dynamite with the Pathfinder series. And the reason why I get the Pathfinder series is because I'd done work those years earlier with Dungeon Magazine, which was published by Paizo. I met the publisher, Eric Mona. We became friends. He read Skull Kickers, thought it was great, thought I had a good headspace for, you know, the tabletop RPG kind of fantasy. And so when the license to Pathfinder got picked up by Dynamite, he highly recommended me to take the gig and uh, put me in touch with the editor. And so now that older contact that I have in the RPG space is getting me my first work for hire gig, and I'm able to get that off the ground and really start to prove myself. Now I've got these two sword and sorcery titles, Skull Kickers and Pathfinder, and I'm starting to build a reputation for myself. The Makeshift Miracle, you know, kind of remake comes out in 2012, and that just helps kind of supplement my releases. So now we've got seven creator own issues. We've got four work for hire in 2012. So slowly but surely building this stuff up. The next year, that momentum increases again. So now Pathfinder is continuing throughout the year. We've got all kinds of releases on that front. I've got Skull Kickers coming out and I'm starting to get other commercial work. So I'm doing more stories for Udon with Street Fighter. I get the Samurai Jack series at IDW, which was a huge um, boost for me in terms of my visibility. And I did a single issue of Shadow Man over at Valiant. Skull Kickers is continuing with another story arc. And um, we're just building up that momentum, keeping that stuff going. But again, look carefully here. You can see that sort of flip is starting to happen. So I've now got seven creator-owned releases in 2013 and 14 work for hire. So the work for hire, the commercial stuff is starting to become more and more of my identity kind of out in the industry. But it's because for the last, you know, three years, I've been putting out creator-owned stuff to such a degree that 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 momentum was able to carry forward. 2014 is the explosion. This is when things absolutely hit a fever pitch. I've got a ton of different projects going on. I'm working for a bunch of different publishers. And even then I'm not sort of sitting on my laurels with Skull Kickers and letting that momentum continue. I launch a new creator owned series called Wayward, which ends up doing really well and expanding what people expect from me and kind of showing that I can do a variety of material. But this year is really explosive. I've got work with DC. I've got work with IDW. I've got work with, uh, you know, Dynamite. Um, and my image stuff is continuing throughout. So it's just a, a really, really heady mix. And this was a year that I was really afraid I was going to burn out. There was so much different stuff going on. There was so much variety of projects and I was juggling all these things. Almost every single night I would get home uh, you know, from school, I would have dinner with my wife and then I would go up to my office, just close the door and respond to as many emails as I could pound away on scripts as much as I could, try and turn off social media and not let that stuff distract me because any day that I wasn't writing was a day that I was losing ground on a variety of these projects. I had a highly regimented schedule. I did not do a lot of social stuff with my friends. It was an intense and wild year. You'll also notice there is the Figment series. So that's actually my first published Marvel gig. 
and I'm finally uh, getting the door over at Marvel, which will obviously turn into a very you know fruitful collaboration. But even this first project isn't superhero stuff. It's actually you know the Disney Kingdoms line. So that's the the stuff that they were doing to promote kind of the Disney parks and what may have you. I did some other commercial writing for Marvel in this period on Spider-Man magazine in the UK and a bunch of advertising comics, but because they didn't have actual monthly releases here, I don't include them on this list. Anyways, this release list is absolutely bug nuts. I've got 11 creator owned single issues that come out and I have 36 work for hire in one year. And like I said before, this was when I was absolutely terrified I was going to burn out, but I could see that I was finally getting traction and making a good rep for myself with these companies. And so I pushed through as much as I could. 2015 is actually less than 2014 in terms of releases. And that's probably a good thing because I was definitely on the verge of burning out and the types of projects I'm doing are pretty balanced across the board. I do the Conan and Red Sonia co-writing with uh, Gail Simone for Dark Horse. I've got more Figment at Marvel. I do the backup stories for Munchkin. Samurai Jack uh, wraps up the run. And I also wrap up Skull Kickers. Wayward is continuing nice and strong. And just a variety of projects. It's a really fun year full of challenges. In that particular year, I've got 11 creator-owned releases and 22 work for hire. I'm pretty well established at this point and I'm making good inroads. I also uh, start working on superhero stuff at the end of this year that will be released in 2016. So 2016 is another really solid year. Um, Skull Kickers wrapped up the year before, so I didn't want to rest on my laurels and just have one creator own book. So I've got Wayward going, but I also release Glitter Bomb. So this is a new four issue mini series that I put together with Jabril. I'm really, really proud of it. The Dungeons and Dragons stuff is continuing. I've got a new Street Fighter mini series. And I start on my first superhero work for Marvel in the regular Marvel universe with Thunderbolts. So it's a, a really transformative year for my career. I feel really well established. I've got a lot of different work at a bunch of different publishers. 11 creator owned releases, 20 work for hire. So you can now see the majority of the work that I'm putting together is work for hire at this point, but it's because I've built up this momentum over the last six years worth of releases. 2017 continues that kind of solid run. Now I'm really well known for doing the Dungeons and Dragons stuff. Glitter Bomb has a second mini series come out. Wayward is continuing nice and strong. And I start to get titles like Uncanny Avengers, even after I wrap up, you know, on Thunderbolts. Uh, all kinds of cool variety, all kinds of different stuff. 10 creator owned releases, 22 work for hire in 2017. 2018 is another explosive year. This one's really, really big. The work that I do on the Avengers weekly event called No Surrender means that I'm putting out 16 issues of Avengers co-written with Mark Wade and Al Ewing. Uh, I launched Champions that year. I've got more Dungeons and Dragons. I'm doing uh, the last arc of Wayward and I get uh, by the end of the year, Rick and Morty versus Dungeons and Dragons. So there's all kinds of amazing variety. The vast majority of it at this point, 42 work for higher releases, five creator own issues. 2019 is another one that is just packed to the brim. Another weekly series for the Avengers. This one's called No Road Home. Um, I've got Black Panther and the Agents of Wakanda. Champions uh, completes its run. Conan Serpent War rolls out. Rick and Morty versus D&D 2. I do a story for Savage Sword of Conan. I'm co-writing Iron Man with Dan Slott, and I release a new creator-owned series. And I think that's really important. You know, when Wayward wrapped up, I was worried that I wasn't going to have that creator-owned stuff in the mix. And I really missed it. And, you know, it's a valuable part of my identity to be putting out stuff that I own and control, you know? In this year, there's only five creator-owned issues, and there's 49, you know, work for hire different releases there. So that creator-owned stuff, you know, is still really crucial to me, even if it's not making up the majority of my time. Because at the end of all of this, no matter how good that other commercial stuff goes, you know, I don't have control over it. 
2020 is obviously a strange year with everything happening in the world. And so, you know, Black Panther and the Agents of Wakanda wraps up and I start my run on Conan the Barbarian, more Dungeons and Dragons, Empire Avengers, um, Stranger Things in D&D, &D, and more uh, Stone Star season two in this case. It's, uh, it's kind of a, a more relaxed year because obviously my original plans to travel and uh, write and, and all that kind of stuff changed with the nature of what 2020 was. And yet even still, you know, in this year, I've got a couple creator owned and then 26 work for hire uh, releases. And I know it seems again, like that may be coming across like bragging, um, you know, the pace of that stuff, particularly some of those burst years like 2014 or 2018, they're pretty wild. And uh, it, it felt like a rocket ride that I could barely keep up with. Here's how it all totals out. And there are other writing projects and there are other things, but if we wanna look at those releases based on the calendar and, and what I showed you in those images, um, there's 333 kind of single issues or releases over 15 years. 86 of those are creator owned and 247 of them are work for hire. What that means is, is that approximately 26% of the work that I released uh, at this point, you know, in my career at the end of 2020 was creator owned. And the vast majority of that was the front end of my career. So it was the stuff that got me established. It was the stuff that set a precedent for the types of stories I want to tell and the types of things that I think I do well. And that's a, you know, a quarter of my work is based on my own momentum, my own ability to start a project and build a project with other people and take it to the finish line. There have been, you know, I'd say almost a dozen other creator-owned projects that I've tried to get off the ground that have not launched. The artist didn't end up being available. We couldn't figure out the budgets. We couldn't find a publisher. All that other stuff that gets in the way of, of you know, making these things happen. But what was important was that I was chipping away at those things and continually trying to put out stuff, building as much as possible in terms of what I was learning, in terms of the people that I was meeting, in terms of putting out work that showed that I could deliver something professional and something entertaining. And that is the course of a creative career. You know, 15 years in this case, more if you look at the original webcomic of Makeshift Miracle. You're talking about late 2001 for that start. And now, you know, at this point, we're in August of 2021. So if you compare it to where my comic creating career started, that is literally 20 years ago. So it's easy to, to look at the highlight reel of someone's career and go, okay, they've done all this incredible stuff. Look at all these books and look at all these things. And I wish I could do that, but you've got to keep in mind um, how long that took. And there are no guarantees on any part of this journey. All you can do is make things, you know, release those things out into the wild, learn from them, grow from them, and then start again and make something else and try and finish it. That is what a creative career is. It's not about being able to perfectly juggle it. It's not about everything opening up and waiting for you. It's you carving out your own little creative space, trying to find time to do this stuff after hours, trying to find time to do this stuff when and where you can, meeting other like-minded people who are excited and engaged and want to make things too, and then putting them out into the world and seeing what happens. Being polite, being grateful, being enthusiastic, and being the kind of person that other people want to work with. That's all I can kind of recommend in that broader sense. And I hope that rather than looking at those slides and being like, holy crap, look at all those comics, understand that momentum, understand how slow those first few years were. You know, in some ways, I wish I could get that time back and be putting out more regular work in those early years when I was younger, when I was more, even more energized than I am now, when I was meeting people and not realizing the potential that was there because I was too scared of putting out work because I was too nervous to, to be critiqued, you know? If I knew then what I know now, I would have been putting out stuff, you know, 
eight years earlier, I would have moved right over from the original webcomic and started publishing more work because, and the reality is, is that even if there are mistakes and even if there are failures and things that don't go the way you want, those successes, you know, for me have always felt bigger and brighter and more exciting. And I hope they're the same for you. Thank you for following along through that video. I know it's a little bit long and rambling and a little bit more personal than some of the other stuff I've gone through here, but I hope it gives you a broader sense of how creative careers work and the different kind of factors that are involved in it. As much as you may want to measure yourself against someone else, it's a really bad idea. What you want to do is look at your own development, your own growth as an artist, as a creator, as a writer, colorist, whatever you wanna do. Are you learning more? Are you getting better day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year? That's the real test of a creative career. I hope you found stuff useful here. If so, feel free to dig into my personal website where I've got a ton of free articles about how to write comics, how to pitch your own stories, some of the economics of creator owned comics, and um, frequently asked questions about what it's like to work in the industry. And if you want an even deeper dive, you can go to my Patreon on there for the price of a fancy coffee, you can go through over 250 scripts that I've written, compare them to the published versions and learn how comics are written. Otherwise, I hope you're having a good summer and go forth and make tons of comics.